Isn't it time? she asked softly. Her husband turned upon her savagely. I'm not going to go, he cried. That's just what I've been telling him. And I tell you again, all of you, I'm not going. You can't bully me. Why, Al, dear, you said, she began. Never mind what I said, he broke out. I've said something else right now, and you've heard it, and that settles it. He walked across the room and threw himself with emphasis into a Morris chair. But the other man was swiftly upon him. The talon-like fingers gripped his shoulders, jerked him to his feet, and held him there. You've reached the limit, Al, and I want you to understand it. I've tried to treat you like... like my brother. But hereafter I shall treat you like the thing that you are. Do you understand? The anger in his voice was cold. The blaze in his eyes was cold. It was vastly more effective than any outburst, and Al cringed under it, and under the clutching hand that was brushing his shoulder muscle. It is only because of me that you have this house, that you have the food you eat, your position. Any other man would have been shown the door a year ago, two years ago. I have held you in it. Your salary has been charity. It has been paid out of my pocket. Mary, her dress, that gown she has on is made over. She wears the discarded dresses of her sisters, of my wife. Charity, do you understand? Your children, they are wearing the discarded clothes of my children, of the children of my neighbors, who think the clothes went to some orphan asylum. And it is an orphan asylum or it soon will be. He emphasized each point with an unconscious tightening of his grip on the shoulder. Al was squirming with the pain of it. The sweat was starting out on his forehead. Now listen well to me, his brother went on. In three minutes you will tell me that you are going with me. If you don't, Mary and the children will be taken away from you today. You need never come to the office. The house will be closed to you, and in six months I shall have the pleasure of burying you. You have three minutes to make up your mind. Al made a strangling movement and reached up with weak fingers to the clutching hand. My heart, let me go. You'll be the death of me, he gasped. The hand thrust him down forcibly into the Morris chair and released him. The clock on the mantel ticked loudly. George glanced at it and at Mary. She was leaning against the table, unable to conceal her trembling. He became unpleasantly aware of the feeling of his brother's fingers on his hand. Quite unconsciously, he wiped the back of his hand upon his coat. The clock ticked on in the silence. It seemed to George that the room reverberated with his voice. He could hear himself still speaking. I'll go, came from the Morris chair. It was a weak and shaken voice, and it was a weak and shaken man that pulled himself out of the Morris chair. He started toward the door. Where are you going? George demanded. Suitcase, came the response. Mary will send a trunk later. I'll be back in a minute. The door closed after him. A moment after, struck with sudden suspicion, George was opening the door. He glanced in. His brother stood at a sideboard, in one hand a decanter, in the other hand, bottom up, and to his lips, a whiskey glass. Across the glass Al saw that he was observed. It threw him into a panic. Hastily he tried to refill the glass and get it to his lips. But glass and decanter were sent smashing to the floor. He snarled. It was like the sound of a wild beast but the grip on his shoulder subdued and frightened him. He was being propelled toward the door. The suitcase, he gasped. It's there, in that room. Let me get it. Where's the key? his brother asked, when he had brought it. It isn't locked. The next moment the suitcase was spread open, and George's hand was searching the contents. From one side it brought out a bottle of whiskey, from the other side it